about a fortnight ago, the rural dean was talking to us. And one of the things that stood out in my mind as to what he said was, don't get in God's way. And that's one of the problems we have. God tries to do things and we as human beings get in his way. That's what happened in today's reading. Jesus explains that he is going to Jerusalem. And Peter tries to stop him. Peter, the leading apostle, the one who is the rock. He is the one who's standing in the way of what Jesus needs to do. Also, I think a fortnight ago, we had the parable of the mustard seed. And Jesus talked about mustard trees. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never actually seen a mustard tree. Why? I suppose we all grew up with mustard and cress. And when mustard grows, up come two little leaves like that. And what do we do? We cut it off and eat it. So it never turns into a tree because we've killed it off. M Margaret's whispering in my ear. I don't know what's about. And so the tree isn't allowed to mature. And the kingdom of God, I suspect, is much the same. The kingdom of God grows because God is at work, often unseen, and we don't know what he's doing. We can't fathom what he's up to. But then, you see, we start interfering. We start getting in his way. We have our own plans. The diocese has its plans. The deanery has its plans. The benefice has its plans. I have my plans. And what does God do? God sits up in heaven and he does one of two things, I suspect, when we try to impose our plans. He either laughs or weeps. You see, we get our grubby mitts out and we start interfering. And we get in God's way. Now the virus, wretched thing that it is, has actually given us time to consider. Consider about what we do and what God is doing. You see, no longer are we allowed to do what we're accustomed to doing. We have to keep quiet and we're not allowed to go to church. The only thing we can do, apparently, is Zoom or complain. And so we have time to think and perhaps to try to discover what God is up to. And our God is a God of surprises. Now, if you had said to me many weeks ago when we started Zoom, that there would actually be more people worshipping on a Sunday now than there used to be in the day, days ago. And that doesn't just apply to us. Apparently, according to some research that they've done, there's been up to an in, a 50% increase in those who worship on the Sunday morning because there's no church to go to. Up to 50%, it's gone up. So, this is my opinion, and you don't have to agree. The church must not go back to doing what it used to do. It may, of course, uh, have to change. Let's not go back to the way we've always done it. And we've always done it because that's the way we're used to it and because that's the way we like it. But since World War I, ordinary people have been voting with their feet. They haven't been turning up to church on Sundays. Why? The Rural Dean made a suggestion. We've been scratching where people do not itch. That's one possibility. Another possibility is suggested by Paul Tillich, the theologian. We spend lots of time answering questions which nobody's actually asking. You see, 
the Church of England is not attractive for as far as regular Sunday worship is concerned. Some churches are indeed growing, notably the black churches and the Pentecostal style churches, particularly in London. But the sort of thing they get up to may not go down very well in deepest Dorset. I suspect most of our congregation don't appreciate amens and hallelujahs and speaking in tongues and all that sort of thing. Not far too enthusiastic for us all knowing that's not our scene at all. But those are the churches that apparently are growing. Some churches, of course, are growing in the Church of England, notably Holy Trinity Brompton and its daughter churches, which now exist all over the country. In Nottingham, the bishop there has started up a new church, a new style of church, particularly for younger people. And that takes place not in a church, but in a warehouse. At least it did until the uh, virus came along. B Peter and Vivian's son Ben is a curate now in Birmingham. And the church he worships in and helps to lead specialises in ministry to students. That kind of church is also growing. It's said of Jesus, the common people heard him gladly. The common people heard him gladly. Now that's not true of the Church of England. People do not listen to what we have to say. We squabble publicly about sex. And neither side wants to agree with the other and they argue with each other in public. We find it hard to cope with those who do not conform to the way we do things or the things we believe. We have a rigid set of services. Dare I say it, those services can bore people to tears. They do me from time to time. Contrast that with the television, which until the virus produced numerous new programs. Now, of course, we get eternal repeats, which are just appalling. But the church, you see, for hundreds of years has done the same sort of thing every week. And some people expect somehow not to appreciate the same thing every week. We have a thing called canon law, which when I was a student, uh, Archbishop Fisher decided to uh, revise. And uh, General Assembly, as it was then, spent years replacing and revising the canon law of the Church of England. We've loved the rules and regulations about what we can and cannot do. You find it in the Book of Common Prayer. If you look at the beginning of the Book of Every Common Prayer from 1662, there's that thing called the Act of Uniformity. We've got to worship God in this way. And if you don't worship God in this way, then you'll be fine. And you're not allowed to worship God in other churches. We don't like that. Fifty years ago, when I was in Nottingham, we started a totally illegal family service, totally informal, lasting about half an hour, and eventually it attracted enormous numbers of people. Now, I'm not suggesting that's the sort of thing that would work here. I don't think it would for a moment. You see, we were in the middle of a great big new housing estate with young families and crowds of children and umpteen schools round about. Even so now has all but died out. I think the first nail in the coffin was, was a, a television programme, I can't remember its title, taking place every Sunday evening and people preferred that to Evensong. But you see even song six o'clock in the evening in the winter when it's cold and dark people don't like that sort of thing these days and nowadays rightly or wrongly our main service is always holy communion i suppose it was the right thing to do but somehow or another that hasn't caught on with 
the people who don't come anywhere near the church. In fact, I suspect it puts them off. We say they're welcome, but they feel out of it because they can't take part. They can't share in the bread and the wine. I remember many years ago taking a communion service at an old folks home in Nottingham. And we gathered all different Christians from the old folks home. And after I had done the first one, uh, one of the leading lights came up to me and said, you gave Holy Communion to Ethel. She's not even Church of England. And I said to her, to the lady who complained, um, we're going to have to learn to live together in heaven and we're starting early. Now, Zoom may well have increased the numbers who worship with us on Sundays, but I haven't noticed whether there's many people who didn't normally come to church on Sundays before. It's gone up because they come every week. Hasn't come, I suspect, yet, because we get new people. I don't think we do. But one of the things that's concerned me ever since we moved here is that every week, in three of our churches, we have coffee pot or its equivalent. And somehow or another, we thoroughly enjoy ourselves and it's absolutely right that you should carry on. But is there some way of linking together what goes in those coffee pot things with some small act of worship, probably before the coffee pot starts? That's only my idea and you may think it's dreadful. When Peter didn't understand what God was about. He got in the Lord's way. And we're inclined to do the same. God is trying to get us to do something and we say, oh no, we couldn't possibly do that. Now we have another reading from St. John chapter 1 about John the Baptist. Now one of the things about John the Baptist is that he didn't get in Jesus' way. So someone's going to read John chapter 1 to us. The next day, John was standing there again with two of his disciples when he saw Jesus walking by. There is the Lamb of God, he said. The two disciples heard him saying this and went with Jesus. Jesus turned, saw them following him and asked, what are you looking for? They answered, where do you live, Rabbi? This word means teacher. Come and see, he answered. It was then about four o'clock in the afternoon. So they went with him and saw where he lived and spent the rest of that day with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You see, John the Baptist's task was to point people to Jesus. He pointed away for himself, from himself to the person of Jesus whom he had just baptised. And the church's main task is not actually to fill pews, but our main task, like John the Baptist, is to point people to Jesus. He pointed away for himself and pointed to Jesus, who was more important. On Palm Sunday, when there were crowds gathering around Jesus, some Greeks came along and said to the disciples, it's Jesus we want to see, and they couldn't get near him because of the crowds. Let me introduce you to a gentleman called Ken Hibbard. Ken Hibbard, when I was a student, was the uh, minister of Skinner Street Congregational Church in Poole. And he was one of the uh, men English on service who went to Hiroshima shortly after the bomb. And as he walked round that town of devastation and death and disaster and dust, there was one thing that stood out to him. There was a building standing, everything else was flat, but a building standing and it was a church, actually a Roman Catholic church in this case. And on top of that church, you can't see it in this somewhat grainy photograph, but on top of that church, he noticed a cross. And that made him think. 
And Ken said to me, as a result of going to Hiroshima and seeing that cross on a, a church which hadn't totally collapsed, I was made to think about the Christian faith and I became a Christian. You see, our God is a God of surprises. Who would have guessed that somebody would go around Hiroshima and discover Jesus amongst all the dirt and the muck and the disaster? Now, strangely enough, our benefice has got connections with Skinner Street, what is now URC Church. Here in Winterbourne White Church, John Wesley's grandfather was the incumbent. And in 1662, when the Act of Uniformity came into place, he was ejected from the Church of England because he wouldn't use the services prescribed in the Book of Common Prayer. So he was sacked, if you like. And then he became the first minister of the new Skinner Street Congregational Church. God does strange things. So all I say is this, keep your eyes open. Try to discover what God would like us to do. That's going to be what's facing us in the future when Lewis starts what is the best way forward for this benefit? Not next door, not copying what somebody else does, but trying to find out what God wants us to be doing here. So we need to think, we need to pray, we need to talk together. And that is what I hope we'll do between now and whenever this virus business dies out, to find out the best way that we can represent Jesus, not ourselves, Jesus, to our communities.